Sai. Yes, this is the fourth worm adjacent animal we've covered. I think I might have a problem. <clears throat> anyway, hello, welcome to Herb Corner, where we'll be discussing the angled worm lizard, not to be confused with the crooked worm lizard, whom we've also covered. No, but seriously, the angled worm lizard, also known as Agamadon anguliceps, yeah, is a species of worm lizard with a rather unique appearance. They're legless, much like worm, mu much like most worm lizards, with a snout sloping downwards, angled even. In most images of them, you can't really tell if they even have a face. They do. Their eyes are just very underdeveloped. Again, like most worm lizards. They're marked with an overall light yellow coloration and brown splotches around their dorsal annuli. Annuli being their ring-like scales. They have relatively short tails, something that sets worm lizards apart from legless lizards. They grow to a little more than 8 inches, snout to vent, and spend most of their time burrowing in the soil. If this is important to you, they also have a hearing range of 150 hertz. Like most worm lizards, they have an acute sense of smell as well. So much so, that it's proven to be distracting to them when introduced to a new environment. They get so used to the sense of a place they've been in for a long time that, when put somewhere far from said place, it takes them longer to start bur burrowing again. As a spade-headed species, they use the sharp ends of their head to push dirt to the sides of their body. Judging based off this skull of another spade-headed Amphisbanian, they have very visible teeth, although they look bigger in the picture than how they actually are in real life. I mean, does this look like a reptile with that bad of a bite? His head is a little smaller than an inch. The angled worm lizard has been spotted in Somalia, within the Horn of Africa, as well as northern Kenya and possibly Ethiopia. There have been a little more than five documented sightings of this species. They were discovered in 1882 by Wilhelm Karl Hartwich Peters, a museum curator and herpetological enthusiast. Their native biomes consist of hot, dry land with the occasional monsoon, during monsoon season of course. They burrow through packed sand easily and are, are used to having very little access to water for long periods of time. This species is marked by the IUCN Red List as least concern. Which is a good thing. It means that their population numbers are not currently threatened. Though we could use some more info on their population trends, it's good to enjoy the small victories every now and then. The care of the angled worm lizard is on par with that of most worm lizards. Humidity is key, layers of dirt is key, you get it. Their fossorial, so thick layers of exoterra plantation soil in a bioactive enclosure is imperative. Remember, without all the com components of an ecosystem, your soil can, and probably will, become acidic. So it's important to have plants, cleanup crews, drainage layers, the whole enchilada. As well as spraying the enclosure with water twice a day. I know it sounds a little odd, like, oh, they're from Somalia and Kenya, it's super hot and dry there. And you're partially correct. It's very hot in most areas within those places, but there's small, there's still portions of land that the, that the angled worm lizards are found in that have a fair bit of humidity, around 80%, I'd say. In the wild, their diet hasn't been documented, but based on other worm lizards, it's safe to say that they're probably carnivores or, more specifically, insectivores. Good feeders for this species would definitely be hornworms, waxworms, silkworms, and cockroaches, among others. Definitely be sure to vary their diet with all your feeders and dust them with reptocalcium. This would mean, for long-term convenience, you'd probably have to keep a breeding colony of your chosen feeders. This can be a little difficult depending on which one you're keeping, though don't worry. There are plenty of resources out there that go into detail on the care of each invertebrate that you could possibly choose. I'd recommend feeding the angled worm lizard twice or three times a week. To really mix it up, you could try feeding them a pinky mouse or two, but I'm not sure if they'd actually take it. Invertebrates are your best option. Other than that, I'd uh, be sure to always give them access to dechlorinated drinking water. Heat lamps for this species would also be a good idea, considering Somalia can get up to 104 degrees Fahrenheit, or 40 degrees Celsius, during the day. Though a good hotspot temperature would probably be around 85 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, to avoid burning them of course, with the cool side being 75 degrees Fahrenheit. The enclosure itself could work as a simple 25 gallon glass enclosure or PVC vision cage. Now, I'm not entirely sure what their temperament would be like, but as stated earlier, I don't think they're inclined to bite. Though I don't know how skittish they are, or aren't, I'm guessing they'd 
probably be more skittish as soon as you pick them up, but become slower as you hold onto them, such as the case with most lizards and snakes and things. Unlike most lizards, however, even though technically they're not lizards, you don't have to worry about any sharp claws or tails that can whip you, so handling is easier on that front. Overall, I'd say they're a moderately hard species to keep, mostly because of the humidity and how hard it is for you to actually find them. So hard, in fact, that you're actually not going to find them at all. Unless, of course, you happen to live in Somalia, Kenya, or Ethiopia. Which, in that case, first of all, hi. Second of all, I'd only recommend keeping this species if your main intent is breeding, to prevent taking too many specimens from the wild populations, of course. Plus, if there were actual importers that sold this animal, chances are they wouldn't really be in the best condition. Now, I know there's exceptions, some importers are really considerate and beneficial for the reptile trade, but generally I'd recommend staying away from considering getting this animal unless you yourself are a very experienced breeder, or if you see a captive bred specimen being sold on the market. But, on the topic of breeding. I'd first like to preface that this may be unrelated to the angled worm lizard, specifically what I'm about to say in a little bit. Uh, this is based off of the paper called Potential Chemo Signal Chemo Signals Associated with Male Identity in the Amphisbanian Blanisinurus, if I'm saying that correctly, which, as you could guess, is about the species Blanisinurus, a different species. I feel comfortable saying that it's possible they have large evolutionary similarities since they're of the same clade and share many other aspects. In general though, this is just speculation, and I encourage any scholars out there to conduct your own research on the matter. What matter? Well let me tell you, let me tell you. This may be the first animal we've covered here that utilizes pheromones to tell its sexes apart. Males secrete pheromones composed mostly of squalene, an organic compound, while females secrete mostly toco- Tocopherol? Tocopherol? Yes. The fact that this takes place is mostly only beneficial for the males, since this species is highly territorial, and squalene is mostly used for a display for a display of dominance or aggression. Since other than that potential trait, the angled worm lizards are are hardly sexually dimorphic at all, that could be a good tell to any potential breeders what the animal's sex is. It is liquid that, that's produced after all, and a fairly visible one at that. Impure samples of it appear yellow, so what breeders could do, instead of the often risky use of probes, is put two of the species in front of each other, then after maybe five minutes, swipe the outside of their cloacas and put the samples in separate containers. You could send these containers to your local laboratory and ask them if they test for squalene or tocopherol, if I'm saying that correctly. This is important because, I'll be honest, I don't know if they do or not. When all else fails, scent is your best friend. I know squalene is an oil, sometimes secreted from plants as well. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what tocopherol smells like, but if the samples smell like two different things, congrats, you have a breeding pair. If they smell the same, you probably have two of the same sex. Though, again, this is speculation on if angled lizard, if angled worm lizards even possess the pheromonal capabilities of Blanisinurus at all. Since they're oviparous, this is yet another case of any potential breeders needing to read up on egg incubation if pursuing breeding for this species. Theoretically, after you've told the sexes apart, there shouldn't be much issue on getting a male and a female to mate. Of course, nobody's really certain since there isn't any documentation of attempts at breeding for the angled worm lizard at all. But either way, the first attempt could consist of pairing two specimens up inside of the female's enclosure. I'd say this is important since there's the possibility that, because of the male's territoriality, putting a female in the male's enclosure can lead to him responding aggressively, defensively, or, you know, something similar. Leave them together for 20 minutes with lights off, then come back to check up on them. If they aren't mating, you can separate them and put the male back in his enclosure. Another attempt can be made the day after, and after that, or limiting it to to be once a week is alright. Be careful when pairing them up, since territorial species are often, in general, more aggressive during mating. The gestation period of worm lizards, in general, is usually around 2 to 3 months with the mating season going from early April to late June. They usually only produce one clutch of six or nine two-millimeter long eggs a year. 
But I think that's going to be all for this installment of Her Corner. As always, sources will be in the description. If you're interested in the topic, I'd recommend looking further into their husbandry or history. If you learned something new with this one, feel free to subscribe. I do these every other week. Like the video to support the channel. Have a good evening, morning, or afternoon. Thank you for listening, watching, whatever. And I'll see you next time.